That is a real plane. A commercial plane stolen from SeaTac Airport by a Horizon employee. Just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. His deadly joyride ending in a fiery crash on Katron Island. Today, investigators scour for clues in the wreckage and in the man's past. He didn't have a pilot's license. Commercial aircraft are complex machines. I don't know how he achieved the experience uh, that he did. And good afternoon, I'm Joyce Taylor. I'm Greg Copeland. We are learning more today about the man piloting that plane. Air traffic controllers called him Rich. Uh, his full name is Richard Russell. He was a 29-year-old from Sumner, and he worked as a ground service agent for Horizon Air. He crashed that plane into a wooded area of Ketron Island. Luckily, there were no passengers or crew on board, and nobody else on the ground was hurt. We covered the story as it developed last night. Here is a timeline of what we know so far. At 7.32, that plane took off. We don't know what ground control or air traffic control knew in the moments leading up to that, but when the plane rolled onto the runway, most likely they were aware something was wrong. A few minutes later, SeaTac Airport shut down, stopping all departing and arriving flights, and then F-15s were scrambled from Portland to catch up to that stolen plane. At 8.47, air traffic control lost contact with the pilot. We can assume it was around the time that that plane crashed on Ketron. At 8.58, SeaTac Airport resumed passenger operations. Now we learned today the stolen plane flew for more than an hour before crashing. Michael Crow and photojournalist Joseph Huerta, they were covering developments as they unfolded overnight. You only had to look up to see what brought air traffic to a halt. And then this guy was circling this, I don't know how many times. Yeah, it was literally like, we, it was like right it was there. crazy, there's like radio stations, ambulance everywhere around us. It was very strange. Strange barely covers. What the hell? The plane was taken from SeaTac Airport. A stolen Horizon Air plane pursued by fighter jets over the Puget Sound. Almost like crash into the water, pull up, come around. The suspect in the cockpit is believed to be an employee of the airline. This might have been a joyride gone terribly wrong. The Pierce County Sheriff says they do not believe this was an intended act of terrorism. Most terrorists don't uh, do loops um, uh, over uh, over the water. Many tried to talk him into landing. Try to land that airplane safely and not hurt anybody on the ground. I don't want to. I was kind of hoping that was going to be it, you know. But the flight ended in fire on remote Ketron Island. Just the explosion and then the um, the smoke uh, coming. And it like, it shook the house. Yeah, it shook the house. Yeah. It really yeah. did. And then we were like really scared and then people told us to get out of the island. The island is so remote, fire crews had to commandeer a ferry to reach the crash. They say no one besides the suspect was hurt. And as the smoke clears, witnesses and investigators are wondering the same thing. He just goes on he the, got away with that. He goes like on the how? plane, yeah, how? How? Michael Crow, King 5 News. So where exactly is Ketron Island? That is where the plane is now, where the investigation is happening. Uh, Darren Peck has been uh, looking at this and gives us a better perspective now on where this island is. How many times have any of us heard about Ketron Island? If you don't live down in the South Sound, you could be forgiven for not knowing exactly where all this took place. So let's spell that out a little bit. First of all, here's SeaTac up here. Ketron Island is way down here in the South Sound. As the crow flies, that's a 25 mile trip. So it's 25 miles distance from where this plane took off. But then there's a whole other element to get better acquainted with what the island actually looks like. We know the plane went down on the south side of the island and as we come in for a close up look, I think that is an important part about this story. The south side of Ketron is far more wooded and far less populated. The uh, whole island itself is about a mile and a half long. And when you get over here to the north side, you can see it's a lot more populated. In fact, on this northern tip here, there's a beautiful home sitting right out there on the northern edge of it. And Greg, you know this island well. You'd been talking about this with us a lot last night when this was all taking place. You had it right. The north side is far more populated. The south side is not. And luckily, that's where the plane went down on the other side of the island. Guys, back to you. All right, Andy, yeah, there aren't that many residents on that island anyway, maybe 11 different places with about 20 people. But fortunately, there weren't more people. And it's amazing nobody was hurt. The man who stole that plane was a Horizon employee, you know by now, who had worked in the operations for about three and a half years. Uh, King Fest Alyssa Hahn has been talking with people who knew him, and she joins us now with what she's learned so far today. Alyssa? Joyce and Greg, we talked to his friends both last night and today. They also confirm and identify the pilot as 29-year-old Richard Russell of Sumner, who goes by the nickname Bebo. Hi, 
I'm Bebo Russell and I'm a ground service agent. That means I lift a lot of bags. Like a lot of bags. In this lighthearted YouTube video, Russell talks about his job at Horizon and how it's allowed him to travel to different places in the world. According to his blog, he grew up in Alaska, met his wife in Oregon, and moved to Sumner with her three years ago. That's when he got a job at Horizon Air as a ground service agent. His former co-workers say Russell just became tow qualified, which means he understood the basic controls of the airplane. They describe him as, quote, super nice and super chill, and that no one ever saw him as a threat. According to his friends, he had the same voice they heard in his conversation with air traffic control after he stole the airplane. Sorry, uh, my mic get, came off. I threw up a little bit. Uh... You know, I, uh, hold on. Ah, shoot. Man, I'm sorry about this. I hope this doesn't ruin your day. Just flying the plane around, do you seem comfortable with that? Oh, hell yeah, it's a blast, man. I've played video games before, so I, uh, you know, I know what I'm doing a little bit. Okay, and, uh, and you can see all the terrain around you. Uh, you've got no issue with visibility or anything? No, nah, everything's peachy. Peachy clean. Just did a little circle around Rainier. It's beautiful. Um, I think I got some gas to go check out uh, the Olympics. And, uh, yeah. I got a lot of people that care about me. And uh, it's going to disappoint them to, to hear that I did this. Um, I would like to apologize to each and every one of them. Um, just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. Never really knew it <clears throat> until now. Russell repeatedly says he doesn't want to hurt anyone. He even cracks a few jokes in the process. But near the end there, you can definitely hear sadness in his voice. His colleagues tell us they did not know anything was wrong. Reporting live in the newsroom, Alyssa Hahn, King 5 News. Well, we want to go now to Glenn Farley, our King 5 Aviation Specialist. He's been covering the story from the start. What do we know so far about how this guy got to where he was? Well, he belonged there. Mm -hmm. That's the key in all of this. Yeah. He had the badge, as we said last night. His job was to work on the planes, move planes around with another person. Uh, this was up at Cargo 1, as we're going to hear later from. Um, it's an area we thought maybe it was Cargo 5 before. This was even more remote. This is all the way at the north end of the airport. Uh, Chris Engels, uh, with our staff, is going to get into that a little bit later. But the bottom line here is he was out there by himself. And one of the questions that was raised by Brad Tilden uh, with Alaska Airlines, he's the CEO of the Alaska Airlines uh, Group, which is the holding company that owns Alaska and Horizon. He really probably shouldn't have been up there, but there was nothing, there was no security breach in him being up there because he was certified to be there. So in the airport, you have what's outside the fence, uh, which is unsecured, and what's inside the fence is secured. And as you go around the airport, is I've spent a lot of time up there, some of it last week, you know, you're, I mean, employees are encouraged to challenge anybody with a badge that doesn't look right, anything like that. You see that kind of signage all over the place. So this guy was legit. But the question ha becomes, what happened when he decided to do this? And people have asked the question about, well, why don't these airplanes have keys? Well, here's Brad Tilden with an explanation of that at today's news conference. The airplanes do not, the doors, I mean, the, and this is aviation in America. The, the, the doors to the airplanes are not keyed like a car. The, uh, the, there's not an ignition key like there would be in a car. This, the, set, the setup in, in aviation in America is we secure the airfield. And then we have author, uh, the, the mindset is we have employees that are credentialed and authorized to be there to, to operate, to do, do their various job responsibilities. So, I mean, those responsibilities can be tidying up the aircraft, obviously moving the aircraft, working with other employees. Obviously, as you saw in that video that Alyssa had earlier, you know, just getting bags on, getting bags off. You know, the weather can vary and everything else, but it sounds like this guy traveled quite a bit. There was some video in his video that we saw mm -hmm. earlier where he was flying along in Alaska. He spent time in Alaska. There's a lot of flying in Alaska, uh, general aviation flying. So that may go to the answer to this next question. This is Gary Burke. He is the CEO of Horizon Airlines specifically. Don't have that. Okay, apparently we don't have that one. Well, let me ask you this, because even though he had security clearance, he was credentialed, there was no security breach, a lot of people are talking about the protocols, how he was able to move this aircraft by himself, apparently, get it 
down the runway because usually it takes two people to move an aircraft. Where were the red flags and why didn't anyone say anything uh, when they're seeing this aircraft move on okay, its own? Let me ask you your question first, and then we're going to go back to that piece of video that, that wasn't quite ready to go. So um, That's not normal protocol, right? No. And that's clearly one of the things, and that's one of the things that Brad Tilden said, is he really had no, this plane had been parked for the night, and it was not going back out again until sometime today. Uh, it had fuel on board. It did not have a full load of fuel for its next flight. I mean, they were just sort of done with it for the day. It was parked way up there, the north end of the airport at Cargo One, where a lot of extra planes get parked overnight. Uh, and then he went up there, uh, and maybe he took advantage of the fact that he may have been the only guy up there. He had the, the, the airplane was parked facing east, so he had to get a tow bar, hook it up to the nose gear with a tug, because you're not going to push this airplane turn it around, around, turn it around, take the tow bar off, get the tug out of there, get on board the airplane, close the door, start the engines, start taxing out. He got no clearance or anything. That's when flags, apparently, we can assume, started to go off in the tower. Who is this guy? There was no, I mean, there's multiple stages of air traffic controllers you got to go through, from gate controllers to ground controllers, on up the line. And wouldn't you normally have two people moving an aircraft? Normal, and, and that was their point. Normally, you would. And he did not belong there at Cargo One that night. But it goes back again to this question of experience again. Here's Gary Burke, and this is the sound bite we were trying to bring you a minute ago. Uh, there were some maneuvers that were done that were uh, um, incredible maneuvers with the aircraft. Uh, to our knowledge, um, he didn't have a pilot's license. Um, so to be honest with you, I mean, commercial aircraft are complex machines. Uh, they're not as easy to fly as, say, a Cessna 150. Uh, so I don't know how he achieved the experience uh, that he did. So yeah. the bottom line here is, again, we know a lot more than we knew last night. Mm -hmm. We do not know everything. One of the things that we don't know, or I should say a large category of things we don't know, is the procedures that he followed in terms of getting into the air. Um, Cargo One is right by 1-6 left. So if he came out there, he could have gotten right on that runway and took off. Uh, nobody will confirm which runway they think he took off from. The FBI has all that part of the investigation. Um, there's another taxiway involved in there, um, and we had heard last night that he may have taken off from the center runway. Absolutely no confirmation of that. So there are a lot of questions remaining just operationally at the airport. The question was asked to Brad Tilden, were there any close calls? Uh, he said no, and then kind of backed off of that question. Um, I don't know what that means. I had the feeling he may have overstepped what he was sort of and allowed to say. And how you would define say. a and close how call. We would de I mean, they come in categories right. A, B, C. Mm -hmm. um, so with another plane on the ground versus one coming in. Yeah. I mean, we... Or we, populations, yeah. et cetera. Right. Right. Mm. You know. Interesting. But this all could have gone down in just minutes. As, as a, a buddy of mine who's a former pilot who used to fly the Q400, he's like, from that point, he could have been on the runway and up in the air in just a matter of minutes, and there's right. maybe they couldn't have had time to do anything. You know, so I think that one of the questions is, is when, what time did the whistle blow? Right. When did somebody notice that, hold it, the engines are running this airplane, um, we haven't gotten anything, they can get on their binoculars up there in the tower and say, check the end number on that guy, uh, which is the, the registration air. number. He's not in our system because most of the clearances and everything sort of get uploaded by computer. Uh, you know, and then the, then the pilots sort of get in there in an airplane that's ready to go. The air traffic controllers are ready to go, and they ask for those final clearances over the radio, and then they get them, and then they start to proceed out. It'll be interesting to see what happens from this point across the country, because the idea that this could even happen, that somebody could just get in an airplane with basic understanding of how to operate an aircraft, and go down the runway and take off and start flying, is very unsettling. Let's talk about this for a minute, which is, Again, we said there are no keys, so you don't go into an airplane, stick the key in like you do in your car, crank it, room, you're ready to move. We have gone over the procedures there. We're not going to tell you what those procedures are, but there are at least six steps you have to go through to start a Q400. And depending on how you can do it multiple ways, that will involve additional steps. So you need to know the sequence of how to do those steps in order to get the engines running. 
Well, he did. He knew that. And clearly he did. And he had no a formal, apparently, flight training. So again, I'm going to go back to the idea that it could even happen is very unsettling for somebody who had no formal flight training. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't mean you can't learn to fly. Right. So we're going to come back to you in the next <sighs> couple of hours. Uh, we want to move on because in the hours following the crash and into today, we have been getting your videos of this incredible event as it unfolded. King 5's Vanessa Mishania tells us more about the video that's been circling the web. Vanessa? Greg, Joyce, now we're at the Steelercom Ferry Terminal where, of course, the ferries launched to get you to Ketron Island where this crash happened. And this has become the staging area for law enforcement as they investigate the events of yesterday. You can check out the Pierce County Mobile Command Center park behind me. Now, the weather right now was very much like last night was sunny, pleasant. Many families in the area were out enjoying a summer night. And that's exactly what one Lakewood father and son were doing when the events unfolded above them and they just happened to have their camera rolling. Hold on. I'm filming you filming me. <laughs> Troy France. So I'm also a daily YouTube vlogger. Runs the vlog Halloween Hellmouth and documents every day yeah. of his life. Are you going to do this too? Uh, it used to be all about Halloween until, and you can probably hear in the background, I got the little one, until he came along. Friday night, he was capturing a moment clipping roses in the front yard with his six-year-old son, Phoenix, when by chance, he began to document something else entirely. Did you feel that? What sound? The house just rumbled. This is when, at, right after I heard the two big booms, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what was that? France then turned his vlogging camera to the sky of his Lakewood neighborhood, capturing what he would later figure out was a very detailed shot of the stolen Horizon prop plane. At this point, I, I couldn't see it, and it wasn't until I reviewed the footage later that I was able to zoom in on it, like right here, and be able to see that it looked like an Alaska Airlines uh, plane. Zoom in on on the fire. As well as the two F-15 jets chasing it so close, you can see the taillights when he pauses the video. You know, the other planes, uh, the, the jets were just like, after it, I'm like, that is really weird. And it wasn't until later that I started seeing stuff on social media and starting putting the, the pieces together. And both of them went right over here, which is south, and uh, went behind the trees, and we were able to film them as they went by. Well, the camera was not rolling from their yard. They heard another loud noise. I thought that I had heard a, uh, another sonic boom, but it was actually the plane crashing. It's kind of wild. And then last night, the, the plane just kept circling for uh, several hours afterwards. For the first time in seven years, this vlogger captured a moment that captured Western Washington and beyond. It's probably one of the first times that I've caught something so major, I would say. You are such a ham. As this dad continues to press play, he has mixed feelings about what he saw through his lens that day. Yeah, I mean, you, you always hope to capture something, um, and hopefully that something is, is like positive and uplifting. Unfortunately, we, we do capture stuff like this too. And, uh, you know, I, like it's been said before, it's, I'm just glad that it ended the way that it did. Kind of horrific when you think about the implications that could have happened. Now, Troy says that when he first saw the fighter jets, he wasn't too worried because neighbors around this area, they're used to military exercises because of their close proximity to JBLM. But it was the sonic booms, he said, and then that commercial plane flying so low that really tipped him off that something was not right. And many who witnessed yesterday's events say that they're just lucky that no other bystanders were hurt in all of this. Joyce, Greg. Vanessa, thank you. So we want to take a closer look now at this aircraft. It is that Q400 turboprop plane. It's on the smaller side for commercial aircraft, about 107 feet long, 93 feet wide. It's the kind of plane that you might take from Seattle to Portland or Vancouver to Billings, Montana. Let's take a look at the cabin inside. It has four Seats to a row with an aisle down the middle. There's room for 76 passengers, two flight attendants, and two pilots. And if you were to buy one, it would cost you about $32 million. Oh, and I know, Glenn, you were just talking about last night, we talked about how you were just on one of these planes recently. Yeah. Now, we flew, in fact, out of Billings. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to use this aircraft in a couple of different ways. You're going to use it because you're going to a smaller market mm -hmm. like a Billings, Montana. Um, uh, or you're using <coughs> it for high frequencies. So between here in Portland, we've done that flight a number of times. I mean, it's sort of like, oh, oh just you're getting comfortable. Well, we're going to land now. It's not that far. Um, but this is a workhorse. It is the workhorse of, and has been for years, of Horizon's fleet. I mean, there's like 40-plus of these airplanes in the fleet. Hmm. 
Really interesting. We're going to talk much more about this aircraft um, and its use within the Horizon Alaska family and also how somebody could access it the way they did and, and, and take off uh, coming up. Glenn, thank you. As